Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to Vlog 230. What is academic writing? Oh yeah, this vlog comes by request from Doug, my great mate Doug. Hi Doug. What happened to Doug is he was getting all these queries and questions and statements from his supervisors stating, look Doug, you're just not writing academically. Don't you know what academic writing is? And Doug, of course, then proceeded to email me and say, Tara, what exactly is <laughs> academic writing? And I'm sure there are thousands of you out there, hi, who are pretty well asking the same question. What does it mean to write academically? That is a great and powerful question. And that's what we're going to talk about in the vlog this week. Because, you know, I'm sure the same thing happens to you as happens to Doug. You send a draft to your supervisors with much excitement. You think you're transforming the world, you're transforming research, this is exciting and you get the draft back and there's all these sort of weird question marks all over it and underlinings and saying stuff like what exactly do you mean here sound familiar yeah and of course in response to that well what do you mean here and you're not really sure either and when you get that draft back often covered in red ink and covered with track changes you just want to spit you just want to swear where you go, I'm going to give up this academic caper and become a CrossFit instructor. Please, don't do that. Stay with me through this vlog before you decide to make the truly catastrophic decision to be a CrossFit instructor. Let's do this. So, can I say, unless you start as a professor, I'm impossibly old, every single one of us, as an academic writer, we have some confidence issues. Okay, we look and go, oh, am I writing well? Am I, am I not writing well? So that's the nature of being an academic writer and there are reasons for that. And one of the key reasons why we always doubt ourselves is no one's actually ever taught <laughs> academic writing. What happens is we assume that if we just keep assigning academic essays and lab reports through undergraduate degrees, then magically and osmotically students will learn about academic writing. Or we treat academic writing like a frisbee. So the supervisor hurls the frisbee of academic writing at the student and the student magically catches it. Winning. Okay, now obviously that's what's going wrong and those strategies, those andragogical strategies are clearly absolute nonsense. Okay, now more seriously, actually, academic writing once more is a case of homology not working, right? Now some of you may remember I use this argument a lot, that one of the reasons that we see so many problems in PhD and research master's supervision is because most academics don't have teaching qualifications and when they're dealing with PhD students, they simply apply homology. That means they supervise as they were supervised. Oh, it's going well. So experience substitutes for expertise. So we assume that students will learn to write simply by watching us write. Okay. And of course, the problems get worse as they invariably do. Academics, Academics, of course, always assume that we're absolutely amazing. We're tremendous writers. We're just fantastic writers. And therefore, our students invariably must always compare their writing to our fabulousness. Wow. Okay. So you can see what's happening here. The supervisor supposedly <laughs> is a tremendous writer and the PhD student is merely an apprentice to our master. Yes. So therefore the difficulty emerges because you can see the issues here. Supervisors are not teaching students how to write. They assume that the drafting and the editing of chapters is teaching people how to write. And as we've discussed throughout these vlogs and indeed all my research on higher degrees and higher education, assumptions 
are actually the killer of a higher degree program. So what happens is supervisors, advisors have assumptions going on in their heads. Students have assumptions going on in their heads. Neither group actually speaks the words and shares the assumptions and therefore they pass like ships in the night and students leave doctoral programs. That's why the attrition rate is so high. So often I compare academic writing to a thought bubble. So, a supervisor has a secret about academic writing and they choose not to share it with their students. Nice. And they also, therefore, I think, also assume that students are mind readers, that they're just naturally going to pick up the assumptions of great writing. Can I say this is also a problem with delivering conference papers, that every academic assumes they're a tremendous speaker and the student will osmotically learn how to deliver a conference paper by watching their supervisor deliver a conference paper. So as you can see, this is all absolute nonsense. So Doug, this is not, mate, about you. This is not about you. This is about a supervisor holding on to assumptions and expectations and not sharing those with others. And then, of course, you know, this happens with academic reading as well. It happens with conference presentations, all sorts of academic dissemination modes. And, of course, invariably, writing reading, presentation skills are best taught overtly. Okay, this is not about sort of accidental lessons learnt from Yoda, right, as he uses the force to lift a spaceship out of the swamp, right, so he's doing this and that's sort of the big thing, but then accidentally he said, and by the way, Luke, Darth Vader's your father, okay? That's sort of how academic writing is, oh yes, let's write this chapter, let's do this, this lab work, let's do this, let's do this field work, great, 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 and by the way, Darth Vader's your father, and that's how academic writing is handled. So this vlog, what I'm trying to do is break down for you the genres of academic writing, and I want to explain to you why it is so complex, and one of the reasons it's so complex is obviously because it's not just one genre, it's many genres that come together and they're dynamic and variable and they oscillate. So invariably you might be using one mode of academic discourse, your supervisor's expecting another and on we go. Now this is one again of a trilogy for Doug. The second one I thought, the second vlog in the series, I thought I'd do something like uh, the quick fixes. So if you've got really still no idea about academic writing, 20 things you can quickly do uh, to improve. Even if you don't necessarily know why you're doing them, at least you can do some things that will see an improvement. And the third one, I want to, again, address something that Doug addressed, and that is jargon. And so I'm going to do a vlog on jargon with or without the inverted commas. So team, the, the thing I also need to say is I really do feel for Doug. He's a mate of mine, but I really do feel for Doug. And I feel for every single student out there struggling with writing, struggling with academic writing. And I get this perhaps more than most academics because I have an incredibly odd writing style. You can pick my writing anywhere, anywhere. And people have hated my writing with a passion for decades. Can I say I also have an incredibly loyal audience for my writing as well. I've sold thousands upon thousands upon thousands of books, so I have an incredibly loyal and wonderful audience. They are my friends now after all this time, and also a group of people that really think I'm pretty dreadful. Winning. So as the great philosopher Taylor Swift has stated, Haters gonna hate, 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 hate. Shake it off. Shake it off. Yeah. So let me just explain the true train wreck of my academic writing to you. My supervisors hated my honours dissertation so much that a week before it was due, 
they made me rewrite it. Two years work, they made me rewrite it. Now I ended up getting a very, very high first class honours for the coursework and for the dissertation and overall. But even at the time, as an impossibly young person, I felt like I was writing as an imposter. I was writing like a machine. There was nothing authentic or real or grounded or anchored about the writing that I was doing. And interestingly, in preparation for this vlog today, I pulled out that honours dissertation. Uh, the draft that I'd written, so the second last draft that was seen to be terrible, and the last draft that was submitted and got first class honours. And can I say, all these decades later, my draft, before the intervention, was substantially the better draft of the two. So that's interesting. But the saga goes on. In my research masters, I was gaining strength and I was gaining confidence. I worked incredibly hard. And what was it? And of course, no supervision. No supervision. So it was me. It was me against the world. And so I thought I'd written an outstanding research master's degree. I really did. I was about to submit it. Two weeks before I was submitting it, an academic asked to read it. An academic in the department, not the supervisors, asked to read it. And he said it was dreadfully written, it wasn't written in an academic style, and if it was submitted, it would fail. Pretty clear. For some reason, and I don't know where I got this courage from, to be honest with you, I submitted that draft. Maybe it was the experience of the honours. I don't know. Never thought about it. But I submitted that draft, and that thesis came back from international examiners, not only passed without correction, but passed with distinction, right? Then we get to the PhD. My PhD was completely bonkers. Again, once more, no supervisions, no supervisors were involved in the creation of this thesis. My PhD is absolutely huge. It's wild. It's bonkers. I'm experimenting with all sorts of genres. It's unbelievable. It really was like sort of a Dada experiment in the Cabaret Voltaire. It was out there. It was wild. But what was interesting is it went to examiners, again the supervisor didn't sign off the thesis, oh we're living the dream here, and three examiners followed me on that journey with that wild thesis and it came back from the three examiners passed without correction. Okay. And you know, how many articles? 13 or so articles came out of that PhD and I'm still in many ways, it's funny, I'm writing a keynote at the moment and there's a shadow or a resonance from that thesis 25 years later. So that probably shows how innovative it was. But if it's of use to you, so here's the, you know, there's the dreadful dissertation experiences, right? What made a difference to me and my confidence was the published articles I was getting out and about around the theses. So these odd pieces started to get published, started to get read, started to get cited. And that's why, for example, I encourage all of you to write book chapters, go to conferences, but also write book reviews, write review essays, write in professional journals, do all sorts of academic writing. And I'm telling you that firstly to gain confidence, but secondly so that you start to see the diversity of academic writing that exists out there. And I think that diversity of writing allows you to reflect back on the thesis, which is, as I've often talked about, is a completely different genre of writing. So people assume, oh, published articles and your dissertation are the same. No, they're not. That's, again, another mistake. They're different types of writing. So it's about learning these different genres. And so as you can see, I've told you those stories so that you know that I absolutely understand your pain. I do. I absolutely understand what it feels like when supervisors and people you supposedly trust and have expertise tell you that your writing is dreadful. I know exactly what that feels like. But today we're going to start to get you once more centred and confident. And I want to start to talk through the assumptions of academic writing that we don't tell our students, but we really need to. Firstly, I just want to establish a binary opposition, if I can. 
academic writing and personal writing. Now, like all binary oppositions, it's reified, and of course the interesting stuff happens in the middle. But to start the conversation off, I need you at this juncture to separate out strongly. This is academic writing and this is personal writing. Now let me drill down those phrases a little bit more. The differences in many ways in that binary opposition are easily specified. Academic writing is formal writing. Let's drill down a bit more. That means the presentation, the interpretation and the examination of issues is read through the gauze of scholarship. So you are doing independent research but that is framed and within a matrix of other scholarship and your engagement with those other scholars is confirmed by referencing and citation. So as you can see, experience is not enough here. Experience, experiential writing, not the point. You have to demonstrate your connection with the scholarly communication and knowledge system. Boom. So academic writing often focuses on abstract concepts and ideas. It has a concise and a very formal tone. And if it helps you, this made a real difference to me. Academic writing is often defined by the audience for that writing. Okay, so who is the audience for academic writing? The answer on the back of a post-it note is yes, other academics. Now, this is important. Don't apologize for that. I'm getting pretty agitated about crew that say, oh, look, you know, a thesis, only other academics will read. A th you know, I'm writing this article, only other academics will read it. You know, that's a waste of time. That's anti-intellectual. So stop that right now, to be frank with you. Stop that right now. Academic writing is precious. And its audience is other academics because... What you are doing with those other academics is you're brilliant, they're brilliant, and you're pushing each other to move to the absolute extremities of knowledge. So academic writing is incredibly precious. It is the top end of town. Deal with it. And I'm not saying don't do alternative modes of research dissemination. You know I believe in that. But it's not an either or option. Show that you can do this. Show that you can bring it. Show that you can bring it, right? And show that you're clever. So what academic writing is showing, you are a master of scholarly tools and you can speak with colleagues around the world. So I'm sorry, that's not only academics as an audience, that is furthering knowledge. And that's important. Okay, so therefore you need to understand what are the characteristics that we see when academics write. So we tend to define a great deal, we analyze, interpret, and evaluate. That's what we do. So academic writing incorporates all four of those elements. Similarly, I think what makes academic writing so difficult, Doug, what makes it so tough, mate, is an academic genre is actually four genres within it. And I always describe this as ACDC. And actually, I wish it was like metal, but it's, but it's not metal. It's ACDP. But just think of ACDC and then correct the last letter. So what is ACDC? P. <laughs> um, it is analytical writing. So that's the A. A, C. Critical writing. A, C, D. Descriptive writing. And P persuasive writing, A, C, D, P. So to provide examples, critical writing exists in literature reviews. Descriptive writing we often see in methods sections. So what did you do? How did you do it? Analytical and descriptive writing we often see in reports. Analytical writing, hard-edged analytical writing is used when we describe and discuss findings, and most importantly, and this is the tip for punters, persuasive writing 
is used in your introduction and your conclusion. And that's why intros and conclusions are almost a different genre of writing to the rest of the thesis. So as you can see, descriptive writing is the simplest form of writing. It provides information, it provides a summary, it provides a record. Still important, but it is the simplest style. Analytical writing is tough and very exciting because what it does is it reorganizes information and data into shapes and trajectories and imperatives, into categories, if you will. So it takes an information landscape and places an order in and around it. So an analytical writing is planned. You have to take a breath, do some deep thinking before you even start and look at the shapes of knowledge. Persuasive writing deploys all the characteristics of analytical writing, so it's tough, but it then allows you to place your views in the marinade. So the academic essay, the reason the academic essay exists and why I'm so desolate that the academic essay has been disrespected and used in the way it's used right now, which is not even really resonant of its incredible history, but there we go. So academic essays are written to persuade. If you want to have a look at what that looks like, George Orwell is a great example of an essay that's persuasive, right? So this is where you start to configure your arguments, your evaluation, your interpretation, but that is framed and shaped by the scholarly literature around you. Wow. Now, critical writing is really probably the most common mode that we see in scholarship. It is persuasive writing, if you will, but it begins with the scholarship of others. So critical writing starts with this is the field, this is what we're dealing with, and your interpretation can shape it. So your view is there, but more significantly, the views of others demonstrate that you can do scholarly work. Critical writing also helps to explain why a certain researcher has made the interpretations or judgments that they have. For me, this is my favorite type of writing. So, you know, just basically reporting this scholar did this at this time. That's fine, but the best of critical writing goes, this scholar did this at this time because. So it provides a context around the history of ideas. Hard to do, but wonderful when you get it right. So great academic writing certainly starts with great ideas, but it also requires hard yakka, a lot of reading, a lot of research. At its best, you have a significant question to answer or a major societal problem that you are attempting to solve. But it also, at its best, is able to smoothly create a flow. We often talk about flow, a flow between ideas. So you take your academic reader by the hand and you move them through the flow of scholarship. Wonderful. So one of the key characteristics that really undercuts anything that you're doing in academic writing is the passive voice. The passive voice basically, there's lots of definitions, but it terms or transforms an object into a subject. So let's just give you an example of the active voice. The active voice, Phil wrote his PhD. Phil wrote his PhD. Active voice. Let's put that into passive voice. A PhD was written by Phil. A PhD was written by Phil. Can you see the difference? Yeah. So the key mistakes that are made besides passive voice are really long and convoluted sentences. So that happens a great deal if people are going, look, I'm getting really attacked for my writing. It's often because their sentences are, when will this sentence ever end? Okay. So my critique often is get people to write very, very short sentences and correct their style. Or an odd vocabulary. We all know these people. You know these people that their, vo their vocabulary is small and they use the thesaurus function in their word processor and they proceed to use a word that basically makes no sense at all. They don't know the meaning of it, but it's there or thereabouts, so they have a go and just go, really? 
Okay, good luck. Uh, plagiarism, thanks for playing Yeah and Up. We'll talk about that more next week. But also ambiguity. So I read a sentence and I don't know what remotely that means. Okay, that's a problem. Also, we see this a lot in a lot of my fields when students use uh, few sources or very low quality sources. So <laughs> in my former life uh, as a professor of media in the United Kingdom, uh, PhD students sadly used to use a lot of pretty low quality textbooks and because of that we would see really really problematic and low quality prose that would emerge in PhDs. Okay, Conversational tone is a problem. Also the uneven expression of ideas. We often see this in a PhD by the way because students grow through the three year process. right? So if the prose is uneven, some sections are good some are dodgy, so evenness is important. And also, <laughs> I used to do this all the time, so this is, I'm talking to myself here, cul-de-sac arguments. So I discover something absolutely fascinating and I just randomly take about a third of a chapter or an article and overshare that with people, although it has probably absolutely no connection with the argument that I'm trying to make, bless. So as you can pick up, academic writing is a mode of communication. And if it helps you, and this did change my life, the whole point of academic writing is to inform and assist a reader. You're not doing it for yourself. You're doing this for a readership. So what you're trying to do through writing is provide a pathway through your information. That You can start with a provocative question, that can work. Also, a great technique from essays, often from George Orwell, is starting with an inversion. So that's a way to really poof, punch somebody in the face. Something that we take for granted and we just assume is right. Invert it at the start of a chapter or an article and you've immediately drawn somebody into your work. The other key and clear characteristic of academic writing is signposting. I can not overestimate this. So that means you you overtly guide your reader through your prose. That happens through topic sentences. I think we did a whole vlog on sentences. It starts with topic sentences, but also writing the transitions between sections. People just go, oh look, I'll put a heading in. No, write me a paragraph that moves us into that heading. That's a transition. So I think the key for Doug and for all of us that move through this journey in academic writing is that we recognise all of us have strengths, all of us have weaknesses and look you may struggle, struggle with concepts, you may have challenges with motivation, you might have trouble with endurance like you can write a bit but you just can't bring it home, right? And all of us have those. And weaknesses and challenges are fine. The grit in the oyster creates the pearl. But you have to know enough to know what you don't know and have the courage, and it is grit, to ask for help and ensure there is a professional development program that addresses that issue. Also, this is important. Recognize your strengths. What do you do well? and continue to enhance those. Now I know academic writing in a PhD is tough. It has scope, it has scale, it requires motivation, but it also requires endurance. We focus a lot of attention, I think, on motivation, but you've got to endure. You've got to endure. And a series of triggers and so forth will shape your work and will start to move you into a research community. At its most basic, in a lot of the social sciences, research at its best fills a gap, right? So what you know about what is the gap in the literature or what is the gap in the history of ideas? If you can write carefully what that gap is, crucial, and then how your research will fill that gap in the applied social sciences and a lot of the health sciences, those two techniques, what's the gap, how will my research fill it, incredible research comes 
from those two questions. So they allow you to frame and to shape and to limit your work. Always be clear about the ground that you are going to cover and what you're not going to cover. So Doug, as you can see, mate, academic writing, it's not a black box. It's not. It's not a secret that we academics are just not telling you. It's not. It has rules, it has a framework, and yes, it has tendencies. All of us are on a continual journey in and through writing. We have good days, <laughs> we have bad days, we have great paragraphs and absolute shockers. Often I say to myself when I've written a really shocking paragraph, who are you? What are you doing? You are an embarrassment to humanity. Okay, so all of us write those paragraphs, we go, who are you? When did you drop that tab of acid before you wrote that paragraph? Really? So what we need to think about is the endurance factor, how we bring multiple ideas together, multiple genres of writing together with the imperative of setting up your ideas for success with an academic audience. That's the point. If you will, think about academic writing as a language, a language with its own vocabulary and its own grammar. And you need to share that vocabulary and that grammar with the audience who will read your work. And if you don't share that, you'll write something and no one will understand it. So it is a shared dialogue. So Doug, next week we're going to drill down to some very quick techniques you can try to improve your writing quickly. But what I'd say to you all to think about this week is be confident. Start to center yourself as a writer. Work out what you stand for. Work out what is meaningful to you. But always remember, you are enrolled in a PhD. You are a student. And that means you're learning. Be comfortable through the learning. So remember, you have the right, and I would argue you have the responsibility to ask questions about academic writing. Look at, analyze, model if you like, the academic writing that speaks to you. But you're doing that to find your own voice and find your own way into this remarkable, productive, inspirational genre. And also remember, academic writing improves. One word, one sentence, one paragraph at a time. I wish you love, light and peace. Tea out.